Great are you, Lord. What a great, what a great line. Can we all agree this morning that, that God is good, that he is faithful, and that he deserves our best? We, we can all agree with that, right? Like, he deserves our best. He deserves our love, our obedience. But I, I think if, if I can just be truthful this morning, while God deserves our best, while he deserves our obedience, while he deserves our worship and our praise, I think we can all agree that Christianity and following Jesus and dying to self is hard, isn't it? I think we can all agree this truth that following Jesus is hard. It is a hard thing to do. But Jesus is absolutely worthy of our life, reverence, and allegiance. He's absolutely worthy of our submission to him, but it, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Oftentimes, we know what the right thing to do is, but we don't do it because we're sinners, because we're depraved. But then again, if I was to ask the question, but, but I know in your depravity and in your sin, but, but I'll ask the question, do, do you want to be in his will? You'll say, yes, pastor, man. I love God, and he is great, and I want to praise him, and I want to be in the center of his will. I want to be a faithful follower of Christ. He deserves that. He's worthy of that, but it's hard. And so that's why we've spent the last couple of weeks trying to understand the will of God. Because as depraved individuals, we want to be people who in our sinfulness, in our depravity, we still want to be obedient to God. We don't want to just justify sin. We still want to understand the will so that we can seek the will, know the will, and do the will of God. And so that's what we've been talking about because I get that question a lot. Pastor, I feel like I'm running an uphill race. I feel like I never quite get where I need to be. Pastor, I, I just want to know what the will of God is for my life. I want to praise his name, but oftentimes I feel like a failure and I feel like a disappointment to God. That's what I hear. And so that's why we've spent the last couple of weeks trying to understand what the will of God is. And so a couple of weeks ago, in understanding the will of God, I taught you that to be in the will of God, to understand the will of God, you first have to trust the sovereign will of God. That was what we looked at a couple weeks ago, that you have to trust the sovereign will of God. I can't give you the answers to why he allows things to happen. I can't. I can't tell you why he hardened Pharaoh's heart completely. I can't tell you why he loved uh, Jacob and, and hated Esau. I can't tell you why some of you are sick. I can't tell you why some of your spouses passed away. I can't tell you that. I can't. I can love you. I can cry with you. I can't tell you why some of you had miscarriages. I can't tell you why some of you lost children at a young age. I can't. And it's hard. But I can tell you to trust his sovereignty. I can tell you to trust his sovereign will. And I can be sure that he is working all things out. For his glory and our good, I can promise you that. And so if we're going to really understand the will of God, we have to first trust his sovereign will. And secondly, I looked, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, we have to be obedient to his moral will. The word of God. We cannot pick and choose what we want to be obedient to. When people, I talk, I talk to people and they want to know what the will of God is and they, um, but they don't want to, to read the Bible or study the Bible or really believe all parts of the Bible. And like you can't have it both ways. If, you, if you're going to understand the will of God and be in the center of the will of God, you, you have to be obedient to the Word, the whole Word. And so that's what we looked about at a couple weeks ago, how we have to trust God's sovereign will, we have to be obedient to God's moral will, His Word, and then in every day, every area, every part of life, we seek to glorify His name. 
That's it. There's so much freedom in that. That if you trust His sovereign will and you obey His word, you can live your life the way He created you, gifted you, and designed you for His glory, every area. And so then, after that, last week, we started Jonah. And my goal through preaching Jonah is that we'll add a little more application to understanding and knowing the will of God. And so we looked at Jonah and how Jonah, remember that he wanted to run from the presence of the Lord, right? He wanted to run from the all-knowing, all-wise, omnipresent God. He wanted to run from him, so that's what he did. He tried to run from the presence of God. Well, that didn't work out real well, did it? And so we are about to look at that this morning, but if you remember the application of last week, because you need to understand that if you're going to understand this week's, Jonah ran from the will of God. He was not the example to follow. Christ ran to the will of God. He ran to the cross for the glory of God. And so if we are going to add application, if you want to say, how can I know that I am in the will of God? Well, are you trusting his sovereign will? Are you obeying his word? And are you running to him in every situation of life? We looked at that in Ephesians, right? You find your strength in the Lord, not yourself. You run to him. You pray to him. You run to his church. You run to his people. You run to his word. And so now we are in Jonah chapter 2. And we're going to continue looking at understanding the will of God. And the application we're looking at this morning In running to God, we must submit to God. Hear that. In running to the will of God, we must submit to the will of God. And I just want to go ahead and throw the warning out there this morning. That's difficult. That's a hard, hard thing thing to do. Because here's another truth that we need to grab hold of. There are times and areas of life where submitting is easy. Would you all agree? There are areas and times in life where submitting is easy. The hard areas of submission are when the will of God requires us to uproot the deeply rooted sins that we so much find identity, enjoyment, and value. And church, that's when it gets hard, and that's what's happening to Jonah right here. Jonah has a lot of things going for him. He's one of the people of God, prophet of God. He had a lot of things going for him, but he was a racist. And Jonah could write his resume out and leave that part out, and he'd look like a pretty stellar guy. But in God's sovereignty, he chose Jonah for a reason. Because he didn't want 95% of Jonah. He wanted the whole thing. That little piece in Jonah's heart that was dark and dirty and nasty. He wanted to, God wanted to uproot that to sanctify him toward godliness. And man, that submission, that submitting to God in the areas that we don't like to talk about, the secret sin that we have in our life, that's when it gets hard. That's when it becomes difficult. And so we are going to look at that this morning in submitting to the will of God. So Jonah chapter 1 verse 17, I didn't get that I didn't get to that verse really last week, so I think it ties in better here with chapter 2. So look at verse 17 of chapter 1. And the Lord appointed a great fish. So the Lord made Jonah get thrown over, overboard. And then the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days... And three nights. Now I want you to not just just hear that. I want you to I want you to try to put yourself there. Like how you put yourself in a supernatural thing. Put yourself there. Could you imagine the smell? I mean, really. 
in the belly of a fish for three days? I smell bad when I don't shower for a day. This man is in the belly of a fish. Could you imagine the temperature? Could you imagine the hard situation? He said, well, how do you know it's hard? Well, when we get to his prayer, you're going to realize how hard it was being in the belly of a fish. It's hard. So for three days, he is facing the discipline of God. Many of you, in your submitting and submission to the will of God, you have a wrong picture and wrong theology of God's discipline. This right here may look hard. You may think, man, a loving God would never, ever put one of his children in this situation. But you are wrong. You are wrong. Here's the truth. God is not paying Jonah back for his sin. Because that's how you view it sometimes. That God is paying you back. God's not doing that. That's not who God is. God is bringing Jonah back from his sin. You need to understand that. And understanding and submitting to the will of God. He is not paying Jonah back. He is bringing Jonah back. Bringing Jonah to the point of submission. You've got two different views of God here. You've got an angry God who's paying you back. Or you've got a loving God who's bringing you back from your sinful depravity. If you have understood and you read through Scripture, you will see that God is good and that He is loving and that He is faithful. And so, looking at submitting to the will of God, sometimes submitting to the will of God often requires God's discipline, God to discipline His children when they are out of His will. Again, this is not the easy areas where God calls us to submit, that we submit to every day. This is the hard things, the areas that need uprooting in your life. Because often when people are talking to me about the will of God, that's what they're talking to me about. The hard things, the things they don't want to give up. And in submitting to the hard things and being in the will of God and not just giving God some of your life, but giving God all of your life since he is worthy of that, sometimes and oftentimes that requires God's discipline. It requires God to discipline his children who are out of his will, but that is to bring us back, not to pay us back. Church. To bring us back. God disciplines his children from a place of love for their good and his glory. Proverbs tells us this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. A good father would never put his child in the belly of a fish for three days in hot temperature and and just a terrible smell and an almost suffocating experience. He wouldn't. Yeah, he would. He would because he cares about your eternal life. He cares about your godliness. He cares about you, church. You say, no way, pastor, no way. Well, let's look at Hebrews. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good. 
that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later, oh, hang on to that verse, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Church, his discipline is for our submission, for our good, for his glory. That's what it is. He disciplines us out of love. It may seem hard. It may seem unbearable. But he is trying to bring us back to his will. And you want to be in the will of God? Then understand that his discipline is for your good and his glory. Understand that. Submit to that. You say, well, what's the alternative, Pastor? People just question it. Why, God, why? Pitiful little me, why? Why, God? God, you're, you're supposed to be a loving God. Why would you ever do that to me? And he's like, I am. It's for your good. It's for my glory. You're not an illegitimate child. You're my child, God is saying. You're mine. You're members of my household. Bought with the blood of Jesus. You're mine. I want to bring you back. I don't want that sin chaining you down any longer. I don't want it holding you back any longer. I'm setting you free. So if you want to submit to the will of God, understand that he's going to discipline you. And when he does, submit to him. Be pruned by him. So here Jonah is in the belly of the fish for three days. And there, there's some significant here. Jonah is in the fish refusing to submit, even though he's being disciplined by God. He is refusing to submit to the will of God, even though that God is loving him. Like, That's not love. It is. Even though God is loving him and disciplining him in a hard situation... Jonah has some that, that deep root is in, and it's, he's so stubborn, he's just in that fish for three days. I'm telling you, he is, he is a stronger man than I am. I get swallowed by a big fish, I'm like, that's it. Right? God, you win. I just got thrown in water, got swallowed by a fish. I don't even know how I'm going to tell this story the rest of my life. You win. But not Jonah. No. Jonah's refusing to repent. He's in there for three days, stubborn. That's how you know that he has some deep-rooted sin. Sin is rooted in idolatry. An idol is something that you love more than God. In church, we face it every day when we're trying to be in the will of God. We have to choose whether we love God or whether we love sin. You have to choose it. And it's hard when it comes to that deep-rooted sin. It is hard. But God's wanting us to choose. And so you can imagine here Jonah in this fish, okay, having to choose, knowing why he's there. He knows why he's there. And God's just waiting on him. And a man is just in there stubborn. <clears throat> Could you imagine all this going through his mind? He had three choices to make. Not submit and die or live the rest of his life in a fish. Right? That's, that was his first choice. He was laying there thinking. After the first day, he's like, I can live here. I can live here. Second day, I don't know if I can live here. Third day, I've got to get out of here. Right? So that, that, that's, his, that's his choice. His first choice was submit or die or just remain in the fish. His second choice, go to Nineveh. But in the back of his mind, he had to be thinking, if I go to Nineveh, they may kill me. They may kill me. They hate the people of God. They're corrupt people. And so I'm going to walk into 600,000 people and tell them to repent. They'll stone me. That was his second choice. His third choice was to submit, to go to Nineveh, tell them to repent. But he knew that if he did that, it actually may happen. 
it actually may happen and they may repent and he hated them and did not want them to repent. You see, that's what in our choices in our life in submitting to God's will, oftentimes we know what the right answer is. We know what the choices are, but we're trying to find some other way. Could you imagine him in that fish for three days? I've got to figure out some different way. And in his mind, I know he was thinking, live here? No. Nah. Die here? No. Nope. Go to Nineveh, be killed? Mm. I don't know that God would ask me to do that. No, nope, no, nope, God wants me to go. And he, they're going to repent. Now he has to decide whether he's going to do it. He has to decide whether he's going to submit. Second point you need to grab hold of is submitting to the will of God requires uprooting of sin or idolatry. Submitting to the will of God. God will bring you to a place where you have to choose. If you don't choose correctly, then God will lovingly discipline you oftentimes. He is waiting on you to make the choice, okay, that is his will. And oftentimes you know what that is. So when people ask me, well, I just want to know the God's will for my life, I almost want to go, really? I think you know. I think you know. My ethics professor in seminary, he said, I get questions all the time about ethics. And oftentimes I say, I think you know the answer, don't you? And they go, yeah. He's like, so what you want me to do is justify a different one. And they go, uh-huh. He said, so go choose the right answer. Go choose the right will. That's what people want. When they tell me, Pastor, I want to know the will of God for my life, what I really want to know is, does, is God going to make me do this? Or, or can you justify this in my life? And we can't justify. We have to uproot sin in our life to be submitting to the will of God. We have to uproot it. He prunes us. You see, in learning this, we know that God wants us to be obedient in every part of our life. Jonah is here, and again, I'm sure he can, he's trying to bargain with God. But God, I do this for you, and I do this for you. I just don't want to submit in this area. And God's just allowing him to hang out in this belly of a fish until he submits. Because Jesus knows the truth. God knows the truth. That he's better than sin. And once you submit to sin, you know that too. When you see you submit to God and repent of sin, you know that truth as well, that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Again, I hear people say, but pastor, it's just a little sin. It's not a big deal. It is to God. It is to God. God is not in the justifying game. He wants godliness. He wants allegiance. He wants submission. He wants devotion. That's what he wants. You say, well, pastor, how, how do I know? How do I know if I am not submitting to different areas, in, in, in different areas in my life? How do I know if I have idols in my life? You do. That's the first thing, you do. You have to ask yourself, a few things. When was the last time you killed sin in your life? When was the last time you killed sin? When was the last time you repented of sin in your life? Repented, not ask for forgiveness, but completely turned from it because God was better. When was the last time you really evaluated the idols you have in your life? What idols? Money? Power? Purity? Forgiveness? Lies, deceit, secret sin. If you don't uproot it, it'll keep you chained down. So when's the last time you looked at the idols? You see, Jonah, he could justify this little bitty dark spot in his heart. He could justify it. He could look at everything else and just forget about it, but God said, no, no. We're going to take some time right now. We're going to get rid of that. You're going to submit to me that piece of your heart as well. So for you, single person, how's your purity? Did I go to church faster? 
I read my Bible, Pastor. That sin, I need that. You don't. And God wants to uproot it today. He wants to uproot it. So look at your idols. Parents, what about sports? Pastor, you, you need to justify that for me. You play college baseball. You understand. I do understand. I understand how it was an idol in my life and how it took me a long time to uproot that sin of finding my identity and worth and value in a sport and not Christ. So parents, how's that idol? How's that idol of sports? Wealth and health and prosperity and popularity. How is it? You see, we like to, uh, we like to tiptoe around Christianity. I like to say I'm a follower and I like to come to church about once or twice a month and I like to read once or twice a year and I just want to, and by doing that I'm, I'm in the will of God and, I, and I'm okay and I can live my life however I want to live and I can have many idols in my life and I can love money and I can love sports and I can love all these different things. As long as I go and I, I flash my Jesus card every now and then at church then I'm okay and that's not what you see here. That's not what you see here. Either Christ is everything to you or he is nothing to you. And when he is everything to you, you want to be in his will. And when you want to be in his will, he will lovingly discipline you and uproot sin to make sure that he reigns supreme in your life and nothing else. That he reigns supreme. And it is hard, church. It is hard. I'm not saying you can't enjoy things. I'm not saying you can't play sports and enjoy it. I'm just asking you, who do you love the most? Because Jesus wants to be first more than anything else. He created you to love him supremely. That's what he did. And it's hard. So Jonah is refusing. He's being disciplined by the Lord. He is refusing. And then after the third day... God wins, and let me go ahead and encourage you, God always wins, okay? He wins, and uh, we can't say we lose because we win too because he's making us, more like a, making us more like him. But he finally, he wins. And listen to what happens in chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed. And I can't help but as a dad to think God was up there like, three days? You know, it's like when you send your kids to the room, I send my kids like, that's it, upstairs. If they waited three days, I would freak out, right? Like, this kid is stubborn. I don't even know what I'm going to do with them, right? What really happens in parenting, right? You send them up there, what, 30 seconds later? Dad, dad, you're thinking, that ain't been long enough. That ain't been long enough. God is not thinking that hadn't been long enough, right? Three days. He finally prays to the Lord, his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Church, that should bring tears to your eyes. Someone who is fighting the will of God in a deep, dark place with sin taking over his life and his heart that he has put himself in this place because of his sinfulness he cried out to God and did God go nah I'm mad at you no he answered because God always answers church he always answers you want to submit to his will? You want to call out to his name? He will answer. You say, well, pastor, man, he couldn't answer me from the deep, dark place that I'm at in life. Oh, hold on. Out of the belly of Sheol, 
This is a near death. I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. He is in a deep, dark, near death place where judgment and discipline is surrounding him. He sees no hope. But who answered? God. Who heard his voice? God. This way he says, All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. He feels like he is driven from the sight of God. Driven away from him. But, but isn't that what Jonah wanted? Right? Didn't he want to flee the presence of God? Isn't that what he wanted? So what did God do? I'm going to give you a little taste of that. I'm going to give you a little taste of fleeing my presence. Being out of my will. And so he experienced that. And he's like, no more. I was wrong. I was wrong. He called out and God answers. Listen to what he said in verse 5. The waters closed in over me to take my life. Anything worse than drowning? They're closing in over me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars closed up upon, upon me forever. Listen to what he's explaining here. This is a deep, dark, desperate place. This is an awful place. He feels like he's drowning. He feels like he's trapped. He feels like he's held down in bondage. He feels like that God has forsaken him. You ever felt there? You ever felt like that? Yet, you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. Didn't he do that for us? In our deep dark, wicked places in life. What has he done? He may have disciplined us, sure, but what did he do? He brought us out of it. Because he's faithful. Because he's good. Because he's loving. Because he's sovereign. When my life was fainting away, verse 7, I remembered the Lord. I remembered the Lord. When life is fading away, I remember the Lord. I ran to the Lord. I called out to the Lord. And he heard my voice. Point three, and the last point. Submitting to the will of God in these hard times of discipline and uprooting of sin. Submitting to the will of God often requires calling out to God in desperation. In this hard place of life that you may be in, in this discipline of life you may be in, that God's meaning for your good, he may bring you to a place that is, that is hard, but if you'll call out, he'll answer. He'll never forget about you. Are you broken? Are you struggling? He loves you. Call on his name. Verse 9. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What did he finally do? He made a choice, didn't he? In he, your prayer, you better make a choice when you call out to God. Don't call out to him in justification. When you, when you call out to him and you're submitting to him, you've got to make a choice. He's brought you here to make a choice for, your, for his glory and your good. So he's saying, I made a choice. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, when that happens, um, don't you think that he should like magically wake up on a beach like showered and hair combed? Like, don't you think that? Like, once I've submitted to the will of God, everything should be like, whew, it's great. No, it says, verse 10, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. Great. It shouldn't have took you three days. Okay? He vomits him out. You know why? Because sometimes we, in our situation, we've made some bad choices, and we gotta, we, we've got we to gotta suffer through that a little bit. We've got to get out of that. But realize that God's bringing us out. We'll continue to look to him. He's bringing us out. And so... If I was to say, man, how do you understand 
and know and do the will of God. Again, you trust his sovereign will, you obey his word, you run to him in every part of your life, and you submit to him even when it is hard, church. Even when it's hard, you submit. Even when it requires discipline, you submit. When it's uprooting the closest sin to you that, that you don't want to give up and he calls you to, you submit. And even when you've run from God and ran from God and you're in a deep, dark place, you call on his name and submit, he will answer. So I don't know where you are in life right now, but that's the sermon that I feel that God has for us. So if you want to pray, this altar's open. If you want to talk to me, I'm up here. However God's leading you. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful that you love us enough to discipline us. You love us enough not to leave us in sin. And I'm thankful for that even when it's hard. There has been times in my life, Father, where uprooting sin has been hard. Following you has been hard. But I'm thankful that you have sanctified me through it. I am thankful that you have helped me and you have walked with me every step of the way. Thank you for your patience with me. And I pray that you'll continue to be patient. And I look across here at my brothers and sisters. I'm sure that you are sanctifying them as well. I'm sure you are trying to unlock chains of sin that are holding them down. So may they submit to you today, God. May this be a milestone day in their life where they experience the love of God and the freedom of Christ, the peace that comes through knowing you, running to you, and submitting to you. Forgive us for our stubbornness. Forgive us for our idols. Forgive us for our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, church.